Hello and welcome. You are listening to an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff of Queen's University Belfast. This is LawPod. Welcome to LawPod. I'm Denise McBride. I have the privilege this afternoon of speaking with John Stannard, a very well-known academic in the School of Law at Queen's here. Uh, Good afternoon, John. Uh, Good afternoon, Denise. You recently got a Lifetime Achievement Award. Can you tell us um, how that came about and how you felt on receiving that award? Well, let me answer the first question second and the second question first. How did I feel about it? I was absolutely delighted. It was a tremendous privilege, one of the nicest things that I think have ever happened to me. How did it come about? Um... Well, I think that there may have been some people behind the scenes who were rooting for me, I think. You have to send in nominations for this. And um, there must have been people who did. And um, I'm very grateful to those who did. I've been to a number of these things before. Um, I was once nominated a couple of years ago, but didn't um, get any further. Um, I was told um, sometime in the autumn that I'd been nominated again. I was pleased. I was told soon after Christmas that I'd made the shortlist. I was very pleased. I was then invited along to the presentation ceremony in March, and I was exceedingly pleased. So I went along to the uh, presentation ceremony. The final winner had not been revealed, uh, at least to the competitors by then. It was in the Queen's Film Theatre, and I got um, a little pot of popcorn that they gave us and toddled in, and um, I went in and um, uh, and I sat away back at the corner, and then uh, my colleague Heather Conway, who was with me, uh, said, don't you sit there, come out and sit at the end. And I thought, mm, I wonder why she's saying that. Well, be that as it may, the, the various um, winners were announced, and one of them was me. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. I was absolutely delighted by it all. And I still think it was a tremendous honour to get such a reward because it isn't a a sort of reward that comes from above. It was a reward that came from my colleagues. And my colleagues mean more to me than anything else. Very good. Excellent. Recently, we've celebrated a number of centenaries. The bar recently celebrated 100 years. The Law Society also celebrated 100 years. And you give a very interesting talk to the bar um, about a journeyman's uh, journey in respect of the leading cases. But I suppose it's a good time to reflect because we've all been reflecting now over those years. Um, So for you, John, where did your fascination with law begin, do you think? Well, curiously enough, um, it took me a time for my fascination with law to emerge. Um, When I was at school, I was given an old-fashioned classical education, Latin, Greek, and ancient history, and nothing else. Mm. And I didn't want to carry on doing that for the rest of my life. And one thing I really used to enjoy was going down to the local courts, especially to the magistrate's court, uh, the quarter sessions, as they were then, Mm. and looking at criminal trials from the public gallery. And I also had a great regard for the great barristers of Mm. um, years past, like Marshall Hall and um, Sir Patrick Hastings and Norman Burkitt. And I would read their biographies, and I said, this is tremendous stuff. So I decided when it time, time came to go to college that um, I might try reading law. And I did. And I must say, it was a great disappointment to mm. me. I didn't really enjoy it very much at all, whether it was I was too immature or whether it was the way it was taught. Mm. It's often said that um, the teaching of law in the past was very much like an intellectual parlour mm. game with nothing much to do with real practice, but I didn't really enjoy it at all. 
it's interesting you say that about your your time at, as an undergraduate. It's yeah. very different to maybe the expectation you had of reading about famous barristers yeah. and and the excitement and theatre of criminal yeah. trials. But I have to say, John, I had very happy memories when I was at Queen's. I remember some of your criminal lectures. Yeah. In fact, can't forget them. The case of Fagan, where. I still hear the crushing of the bones of the police officer as you described Mr. Fagan driving his car over his foot. Um, and you really were an inspirational teacher because oh, yeah. you made the law come alive. Yeah. By then, um, sorry to interrupt, yes. but by then the penny had begun to drop. It wasn't until I started teaching mm. law that I actually began to think, actually, I'm rather enjoying this. Mm. And... um. Perhaps it's an example of um, not doing what you want to do, but starting off with having to do something and getting to enjoy it. Certainly that was my experience. Mm. When I started law as an undergraduate, I couldn't get a handle on it mm. at all. And now, all of these years later, I like it more and more every day. I can't get enough of it. I was going to ask you if you had any tutors or lecturers that inspired you, but perhaps it's the opposite. Well, there were a couple <laughs> who were very good. Um, the ones I um, particularly single out would be, um, one would be Professor Tony Honoré, who started me on my academic career. He was Professor of Civil Law at Oxford. And um, going to a tutorial with Tony Honoré was a delightful experience because he treated you as an equal. You would come in and he would say, oh, now here, John, is this, here's this text of Justinian I've just been reading. He was a Romanist. And uh, what do you think of this? And he wasn't trying to trip you up. He was genuinely interested in what he taught and he was genuinely interested in what I might think. And that, I think, was a tremendous inspiration. Another great inspiration I found was um, Sir Andrew Longmore. In those days, we used to have um, people from the bar coming up to teach us tutorials. And um, Andrew Longmore, as he, um, plain Andrew Longmore, who was just a junior at the bar, um, would come up and teach contract and taught. And he was quite excellent. Um, he was in practice, and of course, he then became uh, Mr. Justice Longmore and, uh, and then Lord Justice Longmore, and he, I would also single out. So, as an undergraduate, there were people who inspired you. There were also things that you maybe didn't enjoy as much yeah. as you, you would have liked to. Um, if you were speaking to undergraduates now, what would you say maybe you could have done differently to have enjoyed that time more or gained more from I your don't undergraduate know. I days? think... I think there's there needs to be more of a connect between the way law is taught in universities and the way it's done. We were taught that law was basically a set of rules. I agree with that, but there's a lot more to law than that. I think law is not just a set of rules. Law is a thing you do. Law is a thing people do. And people learn a lot more by doing it than by just simply learning things out of books. I found this from my experience with the mooting. Uh, a student who has done a moot on a subject will say, I learnt more from that experience about the particular topic than from a whole series of lectures, classes or readings. So essentially, I think it's something that people must do. And the more we do it, I think the better, not just the better lawyers, but better scholars they will be. Well, we'll maybe come to the whole subject of legal education, yeah, how yeah. it's done in a moment or two. But I was going to take you back then to the, your arrival at Queen's. Yeah. You arrived here in probably the darkest days of what have become known as the Troubles. Yeah. So can I ask you, what attracted you to Queen's at that time when Queen's probably had difficulty attracting academics from across the water and yeah. from other arts and parts? That, Denise, is what attracted me. Queen's had 
a difficulty in attracting academics. Remember how I said that when I first did law for the first few years, I really didn't get much of a handle on it. I had an academic post in Aberdeen, mainly due to my connection with um, Tony Honoré, but I never really got to grips with it. I never really enjoyed it. So it ended rather badly at Aberdeen. It was not a success. So I was giving it a second try. And it was becoming rather more difficult, generally, at that time, to get academic posts, especially for somebody like me who had already tried it and not really made much of a success of it. And luckily, um, I was given a decent reference by Tony Honoré, by Michael Firmston, my tutor at Oxford, to whom, who is now dead, but to whom I am very, very grateful. And I tried a number of universities, most of them, I think, through my application in the bin. Mm. A number interviewed me. I was interviewed at um, Aberystwyth, I remember. Um, I was interviewed at Warwick. I was interviewed at Southampton, but didn't really um, get beyond the shortlist. And then my father gave me an advertisement. And in those days, the Guardian used to advertise, I think it was on Tuesdays, academic posts. And there was a little thing saying, Queen's University of Belfast are appointing three lecturers um, in any subject. And he'd written on the bottom, there won't be very many people in for these. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, where sh shall I give it a try? And I thought, well, any port in a storm. I'd never been to Ireland before. I'd certainly never been put in, set foot in Belfast or in Northern Ireland. But I decided, all right, I'll give it a try. And I was shortlisted and I was summoned to interview, which happened to be in the middle of the second loyalist Ulster Workers' Strike in 1977. <laughs> so that was quite an eye-opener. And to my surprise, I was given the job. And can, and can I say you? one other thing? There is nowhere else that I would ever want to work. Well, that's what I was going to say. You, have, you came in 1977. 77. And you've remained here ever since. I have remained here ever since. We know that academics quite often move around. I mean, is there any reason why you think you stayed here all that time, John? Well, I love it here. I just like, I find it so friendly. Um, I'm used to my colleagues. I haven't been always an easy colleague. I had a tremendous amount of support and I needed a tremendous amount of support in the early days. I'm very grateful to Professor Colin Campbell, who was the dean yeah. at the time, who was presided over my interview board. I got a tremendous amount of support for him. The other person I would like to single out as being exceptional was Desi Greer, hmm. Professor Desmond Greer, who's um, still with us. But, um, he's still around. He's retired for a number of years. But his support was incredible. And Everybody was rooting. I felt always that everybody here was rooting for me, you know. <laughs> Michael Knight, another great colleague from days past, he was a tremendous um, help and support. And I say, well, why would I ever want to uproot myself and go somewhere else when I'm happy enough here? And part of the role at Queen's obviously is the academic side and then there's the teaching side and I said it would come to the teaching side but before yeah. I do that initially your interest would have been in Latin Roman law I think well, I did yeah. and then you moved to criminal law and then I think now you're t uh, involved in law and emotion law and emotions emotion. yeah now I mean we know that there's a wide ambit of legal subjects that you could have chosen right from human rights and land yeah. law property all of those different areas can you tell us why you went for Roman and Latin law and then how you've made that transition through to criminal law and then now to law and emotion? Well, um, 
I'd say two things here. First of all, I would say I started off in Roman law because that's what really got me my academic post in Aberdeen in the first place. The um, offer was um, that I, I still got the letter from Tony Honoré saying they want to appoint a Romanist. And uh, he thought I might be a promising Romanist. Um, in fact, um, I didn't. Um, get the handle on Roman law, though I could teach it at a certain level. I didn't have the Italian, I didn't have the German, which you must have in Roman law. How did I make the transition? Well, in those days, when you started as an academic, you weren't given a lot of choice as to what you taught. You were told, you will teach this. And um, I think I asked to teach equity and trusts, which had got quite a good mark in in my exams at college. Um, and I asked to teach contract, and I was told you couldn't teach contract because there were already plenty of people teaching contract. You will teach criminal law. Now, I never got a handle on criminal law at college. I, I was hopeless at it, but I do as I'm told. And as I said when I, in my lecture, in fact, um, about the journeyman's um, view, I am essentially a journeyman academic. A jack of all trades, I will turn my hand to what I am asked to do. So I turned my hand to criminal law, so I'll give that a go. And actually, it clicked. Ha! Huh, I'm beginning to like this. I'm beginning to get a handle on it. And so it's been with other subjects. I was asked a few years ago to teach employment law and um, with uh, my colleague David Kappa. Never taught it before in my life, but I thought, well, I'll, you know, if, they, if they're stuck, I'll do it. And I quite got to quite enjoy it. Law and emotion is slightly different. Back in the 1990s, I got this wonderful idea that there might be some emotional dimension to law. Um, and... Um, I used to go around conferences suggesting this and thinking how clever I was until I attended one in the United States and somebody took me aside and said, do you know, we've been doing this for a number of years. Are you not aware of X, Y, and Z? And I hadn't been, but now, of course, I did become aware of X, Y, and Z, and I've done quite a lot on it since, um, in particular um, with um, my colleague Heather Conway, and I think this is very much a very exciting and um, uh, 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 an innovative um, angle on the law. Well, I have to say, John, you describe yourself as a journeyman, but in terms of criminal law, I mean, certainly from my perspective as a student, you really seem to have mastered the subject. Yeah. And you also were very good at communicating that yeah. to the student. So in terms of teaching, I mean, you did encapsulate that unusual quality of not only being an academic, but also a teacher. Yeah. And that's quite unusual, I suppose. But um, if I can take you back to your days of teaching students, yeah. have you any particular memories of um, a lecture or tutorial that stands out in your mind or, or a student who asked a difficult question or anything of that nature? I think, I mean, lecturing is a funny thing because I tend to be a little bit lacking in confidence. And I thought I will never, when I was back at Aberdeen, I thought I will never, however will I get my head round lecturing to a large number of people. And um, we were taught now, the one thing you must be aware of is disorder in lectures. And there actually was in the 60s and early 70s quite a lot of disorder uh, and student um, disruption of lectures and generally sort of school child, school boyish, school girlish, mostly boyish behaviour, you know, throwing paper darts and heckling from the back. They said, well, how will I cope with this? And um, when I gave my very first lecture, which was on Roman law, in fact, it was on the Roman law of the sources, I actually came out of it and said, I actually rather enjoyed that. And I discovered I had a bit of a talent for it. You say, why do you communicate? Not all academics communicate too well. Some academics are too clever to communicate well. It takes somebody perhaps who is rather less clever, rather more on the level, 
of the audience to be able to teach a subject because, you know, you like to keep it simple for yourself, so you try to make it simple as you can for the audience. Well, of course, it is a technique to make the complicated simple, isn't it? That ticks. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe. Mm, indeed. Yeah. Now, just in terms of your teaching, I remember you had a somewhat unusual um, lectures where, for example, you did a reading of Alice in Wonderland in the I middle did, of I it. Did. Can you give us some of your thought know. process well, I think it for was, that? I, think, um, I don't know whether it, <laughs> um, the idea was a perfectly good one, the perfectly sound one, that you can't keep somebody's attention for more than a, a certain limited amount of time. I go along to church on a Sunday and I sit and listen to a sermon. And if it's more than about 15 minutes, I say, I really can't bear this. And if I got one that was half an hour, I would say this was intolerable. And yet we go in and we teach for a, a whole hour and we expect students to keep their attention all the way through. Um, and there's a sort of lack of fit there, I think. Hmm. And I think it does need to be broken up. The, it could have been anything. Um, I did the Alice in Wonderland. I don't know. Did you enjoy it? It certainly was novel, and I think it, it probably worked in terms of helping you concentrate on what you'd heard in the first part yeah. of the lecture. You had time to reflect, yeah. and then you moved on to a new I gave up. I, lacked part. I, I didn't have the confidence it was working very well, actually, so I gave up doing it after a while. But I don't know whether I was right or wrong to give it up. Um, but I do think um, the basic point is that um, students do need something of a break even if it's just chat among yourselves for five mm. minutes, rather than just bang, 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 bang without. Yes. Well, you've described some changes now in the delivery of um, legal education, and, and things are changing probably oh, yeah. very rapidly at the moment with technology and probably a new breed of students who are used to social media. Yeah. So many limitations in character for Twitter. Yeah. You have to communicate in a short form. Yes. information and also information overload. So um, do you think that there are changes that we need to make in terms of how we deliver education? Well, um, yeah, I do indeed. I do indeed. And I don't know whether I'm the person to make them at, at this stage. Um, take the lecture. Um, over re in the lockdown, we've had to get used to, instead of lecturing to a big class, we've had to get used to the recorded lecture. I am a great convert to the recorded lecture. It may not be as fun as a good stand-up knockabout lecture of the sort that I used to give and that Michael Knight used to give, but when it comes to communicating information, I love the recorded lecture because they can go back and go over it again and again and again and again and again. Um, so. I'm a great convert to that. Um, I agree with you fully about things like Facebook and Twitter. That is what they are used to. I'm the generation who has never really got a handle on Facebook and Twitter. Um, but it, that has to be done. I think that um, that is the way it's going. It has to be, you know, we, we have to adapt ourselves to that. I mean, recently I was speaking to the master of the rules, um, Jeffrey Voss, who is a great fan of the use of technology. And he was saying that so much of what lawyers do now can be done by machines. Yeah. And I have to confess, I, I'm a bit of a Luddite. I don't like to think I can be replaced by a machine. Um, but do you think there is a future for lawyers, for academics, or, or can we be replaced by a machine, do you think? Well, some things, yes. Some things we can do um, um, can be done by machine. A lot of it is done by, I mean, certainly the days of having to go over to the library and get a great pile of law reports. I mean, now we can look up at everything online. So conveying information, that sort of thing, can very much be done by machine. Um, I don't think it, um, it can all be done by machine. Remember how I said a minute, uh, uh, at the beginning, law isn't a thing that is just a set of rules. Law is a thing people do. And um, you need the human touch. This is where the law and emotion comes in. 
especially in relation to handling people. Um, a lot has been, a fair bit has written, been written about emotion and judges. Um, I think even more is, but now we need things written by emotion and solicitors and barristers. Emotion and the police, well, the police have always done emotion. You try to calm an angry crowd and when there's only, you're on your own and there's uh, people kicking off. Uh, that requires emotional management. That couldn't be done by a machine. So I think uh, certainly there is a place for the machine, but we've got to have the human touch. And in terms of the future of um, legal education, do you think then that looks bright? Well, I think so. I think we have to. I mean, we've got all these, uh, we have all of these these tools at our disposal. We can, use, But that we still have to have, what worries me a bit now is it that university is so anonymous for a lot of students. They come in, they're in a huge class. They very rarely see their tutors. They may see, they may see um, a, a teaching assistant um, doing a tutorial or seminar once a fortnight, but the professors, uh, the lecturers, they may very rarely see at all, except on a on a screen. I think that's a great loss. We've got to have the um, personal touch. Now, a few years ago, um, we used to have a, a compulsory dissertation. And I was in two minds about the compulsory dissertation. Yes, it's an awful lot of work for the academic staff to have to deal with all these dissertations. They used to drive me mad, and they used to drive the others mad. But one thing I particularly liked about them, they gave you the chance to one-to-one -one with a student to show them, to guide them on a piece of work, it gave them a personal element that is so sadly lacking in the universities. I think at Queen's very much so. I mean, the bigger subjects. Um, I think we do need that personal element. And the time that personal element goes, we might as well give up. I really do feel that, yeah. Because I suppose that reflects that law in action is actually about relationships. It, exactly. I couldn't agree more. Law in action is about relationships. I like that very much indeed. And I think you've got to make, this is the law and the emotion comes in. You've got to, it's about dealing with people. <laughs> well, look, John, it's been absolutely fascinating to hear your reflections on your yeah. life in law. It's been a real eye-opener to me uh, to see how sometimes you didn't choose the law that you did, but no. it chose you and how that changed uh, the way you presented and um, your view of the law. Um, so, look, thank you for that. Um, can I just ask as we finish, what one word would you use to describe your career in academic law or, or you as a person um, with regard to the law? One word? One word, or maybe three. <laughs> well, four. Four. Okay, we'll allow that. I've got away <laughs> with it. And can I use one word? Yeah. To say you're a one-off. Thank you Thank very you much very indeed. Much. Thank you. <laughs>